Hello again. Uh, in this video I'm going to be talking about some techniques for doing really a variety of drawings in the sketchbook, but I'm going to focus on elevations for this one. I don't know that I'll do an entire drawing uh, here on camera, but I'm going to show different parts and pieces about how I might use a couple of different kinds of pens to do the line work and then uh, some watercolor technique. Also, maybe talk a little bit about text and how I might approach that. So I hope you enjoy it, I hope it's helpful, and uh, let's get started. First thing I'd like to do is just show what I've got here. When uh, the weather was a little bit nicer earlier today, I went out and roughed out a, uh, an elevation of the front of Art and Architecture South. Hopefully you can see that I've used a fairly light pencil line. I don't want to put a lot of graphite on the page, so I'm trying to be pretty careful about that. If I ended up kind of pushing down a little too hard on the pencil, I might grab a kneaded eraser and just sort of push on it. I don't want to rub the page because that starts to affect uh, the quality of the watercolor paper. So. I generally would not use a, um, an eraser like this, and I certainly wouldn't be really rubbing down to erase lines. I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, the, the pencil lines that I've got here are light, because I'm going to go back and uh, go over those lines in ink, and I'll show a few different ways that I might do that. Uh, so this is my drawing. I've also mapped out a couple of spots here and here for text. I've added, you know, some indication of just some kind of tree and plant shapes here. Uh, I was careful to pay attention to the slope of the kind of sidewalk and street in front. And I did my best to kind of take a look at what was going on up here by, again, stepping pretty far back from the subject and looking at that carefully. Uh, one other thing I'll point out here is I haven't drawn everything in pencil. Uh, you know, you can see perhaps in some of these windows I started kind of giving myself some horizontal lines to show where those mullions were, whereas over here I just kind of left them rectangles. That doesn't mean I'm not going to fill in the window frames. I just don't need to draw everything in pencil because if I've got this guideline then I can work my way in with the pen and draw some more. But all of this stuff, I really tried to record while I was out there. Uh, and if it was a nice day, I would have kept going. I would have done the ink out there, and I would have done some watercolor out there, if not all of it. It really is best to draw on site if you can. But um, maybe I'll show it here in just a second what the weather is doing right now. This is why I have retreated to my studio. So you can see what it's doing outside right now. This is why I am here in my office uh, and not outside trying to paint. Idaho. <laughs> so once again, I, I've done all of this stuff outside. I kind of walked through that process before and I'd rather kind of cut to the chase and talk more about specific techniques. And that, at this point, really starts with pen and ink. Although I will say one word about pencils. Um, the pencils that I use to do this kind of thing, usually I'll use a pencil like this, which is actually a 5H. <laughs> it's a very, very hard uh, graphite, and so it doesn't wear down much, and that's why the outside of this pencil is pretty beat up, because I've been using it for years and years, and I very rarely have to sharpen it. But I just, I use it with a very light touch. So, only really I can see that line clearly when I'm right on top of the book. It's not intended to, you know, put a lot of graphite on the page. It's really just intended to give me guidelines. I've drawn most of these lines darker than I ordinarily would, so that they really do show up here on the video. Um, but typically I work even lighter than this, and I'm just giving myself guidelines so that the pen and ink and the watercolor are what really kind of pop off of the page, and the, the pencil lines eventually kind of disappear. So here's a few different pens that uh, you could use. I think your kit came with pens pretty much like these, if not the exact same kind, um, which are just, you know, permanent black India ink pens. 
and they work just fine. Uh, the advantage of these is that they come in a couple of different line weights. I'll demonstrate those in just a moment. Um, and those work just fine because they, they don't, uh, when you add watercolor to them, they don't run, uh, it doesn't dilute, etc. So those are really good pens. I'll demonstrate those. Uh, these are a couple of fountain pens that I use pretty frequently. This one has some black ink in it uh, and the other one has some brown ink in it. And these two inks here are a couple of the inks that I use for fountain pens. I'll demonstrate both of those also. Uh, and then if you really want to go old school, uh, you could get one of these. These are really inexpensive, whereas, you know, <laughs> these cost a little bit. Uh, these cost a bit more. And this is cheaper than all of them <laughs> because it's the simplest of the tools. This is what I would call a dip pen. And uh, there's particular ink that you use for that. Really, you could use just about any ink for this, but I like uh, the acrylic ink because it's very waterproof. These two uh, fountain pen inks that I was just talking about, Diatramentus makes a really good inks called document inks, brown, blue, black, etc. Um, and Noodler's ink, uh, particular kinds of Noodler's ink. This one is called Lexington Gray. Both of these can be used in fountain pens, but at the same time, once they hit the page, they become waterproof. So those work really well with watercolor too. Uh, acrylic ink, of course, once it hits the page is pretty much bomb proof. So watercolor doesn't affect that either. Um, if you're working with colored pencil, those considerations might not matter quite as much, but uh, I encourage you to try and work with watercolor. As I pointed out, it's quicker and uh, I think a lot has a lot more potential actually than colored pencils, but colored pencils are also a wonderful tool to use for adding color. And maybe I'll demonstrate a little bit of that as well. So let's go through some of these pens. Uh, this one is B, I think that means brush. This one is S, which uh, I don't know what S means, but it's pretty small. Maybe that's what it means, small. Uh, so it's gonna give you a nice, just thin line. Uh, you can even lighten up on the pressure a little bit and get a really thin line or bear down on it a little bit and get a little bit heavier of a line. Uh, it works very good for hatching, etc. Really good pen. Uh, and then this is its sort of, com uh, what am I trying to say? It's friend <laughs> that's a larger weight. This is a brush pen. And likewise, we can use a light touch on it and get a reasonably light line, or we can kind of bear down on it and get a nice heavy line. So these are the pens that I've been talking about where uh, in my comments on your work, it's nice to work with two pens like this. You can get a light line really easily and a medium line for that matter, and a heavy line very easily with the exact same kind of ink. So there's no kind of difference in the color of the ink or anything like that. And they're both waterproof. So really excellent, affordable solutions for adding uh, ink to a sketchbook page. Fountain pens, again, offer some other solutions here. For one thing, because you can refill them. You can fill them with a variety of different kinds of inks. I already talked about the fact that you can put different color uh, inks in a fountain pen. You can refill it. Um, the pen itself costs some money, but you don't throw it away. You know, these other pens I was just talking about, when they're done, they go in the garbage. This thing stays in your pocket and it gets refilled. Um, I've had this pen for, I don't know, five years or so. I've had another pen for many, many, many years. So they're, they're a good investment because they last a long time. And likewise, you can use a light touch. You can even flip the pen over with certain kinds of fountain pens and get a really nice light line, almost razor thin. Or you can bear down it, push a little harder, and that puts a bit more ink on the page. So in one tool, we can get a variety of line weights just based on pressure and how we're using the tip. Here's another uh, one of these fountain pens. This one's called a Super 5. I think these go for maybe $20, $25, something like that. Um, and in this one, I've put some of the document brown ink in here so that you can see that we get a different color ink and same sort of thing, a nice thin line, but then you bear down and you get a little bit more ink on the page, right? 
You can't get like a super fat line with these, but you can get a, a bit of variation. Some kinds of fountain pens really allow for a much wider line. Uh, it all depends on what we call the nib, which is this thing right there, how it delivers the ink to the page. And that's another advantage of fountain pens is that there's a lot of different kinds of nibs. Uh, not necessarily for the same kind of fountain pen, but to some extent you can mix and match or just get the kind of nib and the kind of fountain pen you really like. And of course, the kind of ink you like. And as I said before, we could go fully old school with this and use a dip pen where you just dip it into the ink. I had to shake this ink up so there's a lot of bubbles in it. Uh, but you dip it into the ink, you get a certain amount on this nib, which is likewise interchangeable. Um, and then you can go about drawing. And you'll see right away, one of the amazing things about these pens is you can get razor thin lines. You can also bear down on it and get a nice thick line. So these are really pretty special pens. Uh, you know, they're not disposable. Again, you can keep these things for a very long time. They can draw super thin lines. They're really nice for hatch patterns because you just get this very, very consistent little, uh, very razor sharp line. And then, you know, when you're done with it, uh, hang on just a second. And then when you're done, you just, you know, wipe it off. You wipe off the excess ink, clean it up good, some soap and water if you need to, and you're all set. And if you wanted to interchange the nibs, that thing just pulls right out of there like that. Snips in there like that. I am getting some ink on my hands already because it is a little bit messy, right? It's not contained in inside a pen. Uh, but these things are a really affordable option and they produce lines like no other pen I've ever used. And just because I'm in a bit of an old school mood today, I'm going to use this pen to uh, add the ink to this drawing. I'm going to do that before I do any watercolor because, again, this is acrylic ink. Uh, the color is called sepia. It's, it's a little bit of a darker brown color, not quite such a jet black color. And personally, I find that sort of sepia tones, brown tones work really well with watercolor in the sketchbook. Um, that's just sort of personal preference. Uh, I encourage you to experiment with a variety of colors. thing I'm trying to do here is to give sort of a medium line weight at these elements that are projecting outward here. If you know this building then you know that this little parapet projects upward so I'd give that kind of a medium line weight and then uh, what's more kind of right up against that brick I'd give a nice thin line weight and again you know with this pen, you see how easy that is. I'm just letting up a little bit on the pressure and uh, getting a nice thin line weight there and then putting a little pressure on and getting more of a medium line weight there where this thing projects and we're seeing sort of a profile against, you know, space behind it. Uh, I could do that as well with the roof here. I've already drawn those lines, but I'm going to leave those alone for now um, and kind of continue, you know, with the, the kind of medium and light line weights uh, on the facade here and the stuff that's kind of beyond in the background, like this monitor up here and the roof lines. I'm actually going to leave those light to kind of indicate that they're further in the background.
With this acrylic ink, sometimes uh, it can get a little bit stubborn. Maybe you saw I had to kind of push down a little bit on the pen to kind of get it moving again. Uh, and that's just, you have to sort of keep the tip of the pen clean every so often. I'll just wipe it off with uh, a paper towel. That'll make sure that I, I keep a reasonably clean line going uh, because otherwise it can get a little bit clogged up. The acrylic ink is, uh, it's not water soluble, so it does have kind of a tendency to start to gunk up in the pen a little bit. And so that's one consideration you have to make when you're working with uh, an old fashioned instrument like this. Um, but they really are wonderful to work with once you get accustomed to it. I used to do quite a lot of drawings with these pens. Uh, kind of gave it up just because of the convenience factor because most of the time I'm drawing on site. And that is one of the decisions that I made here because I'm inside and it's just easier to work with if you're using a dip pen um, to have you know some paper towels and, and to be able to just put the uh, the bottle of ink down when you need to. Uh, that is something that's nice about working inside as opposed to outside. And I think that's going to do it. I have, as I said before, given myself some kind of like guidelines to show where I'm going to have things like some plants in front. Um, but I'm not going to draw that in pen. I'm just going to focus on watercolor for that. Same thing up here with the text. I don't quite know yet what I'm going to write, but I don't know. It'll be something. And, uh, and I've given myself space for that. Now I can probably uh, start diving in with some watercolor. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. But before I do that, I want to make sure that I clean up my pen. Uh, acrylic ink, when it dries, can be pretty stubborn stuff, but it's actually easy to clean up if you catch it while it's still wet. So uh, if it's not really nice and clean, I might just go put a little bit of soap and water on here, um, but I'm not too concerned about it. It uh, seems like it's pretty clean. Okay, time to do some watercolor here. A couple of things right off the bat. I don't know that I'll paint the entire thing here, uh, but I at least want to show some techniques. Um, and one of the things I'm going to be doing is snapping out my brush quite a bit. I mentioned that in an earlier video. I've got two cameras set up here now so you can really see how that works. Other thing I want to do is show kind of how quickly I work in real time, or try to anyway. And this does take some practice. Don't rush it at first, but you do kind of need to move reasonably quickly to move the water across the page and then pull the water up at the end and let it dry. Okay, so I'm going to do that with this roof right here. And I'm just going to assume that this is sort of a bluish, you know, if I was out there working uh, in person or live, let's say, on site, uh, I might really be thinking more carefully about the, the colors that I'm using, but I'm not super concerned about that right now. I'm just mixing up a, a fairly light gray. You'll notice I'm taking uh, three colors, the three colors, three of the colors that you have. So ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and azo yellow. And I'm mixing them together to get something like a gray. If it starts to go a little too green, uh, I might add a little bit of red. If it starts to go a little too brown, I might add a little bit more blue. So I've got some water, and that's probably enough to get started right now. Once again, the brush is fully loaded here. I've still got some wash on the page, or excuse me, on my palette. And then I'm just going to start in here and fill this space. And I'm holding my book, you'll notice, so that I can pick it up and move it when I want to. So that what I'm doing is letting gravity really move that bead of water down the page. The other thing that I'm going to do here is mix it up a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more blue as I go, maybe. 
and that's going to give me some variation. Watercolor, uh, it's good to practice doing nice, sort of solid, consistent washes, but it's also really good to be able to learn how to mix on the page, is what I would call it, where I'm adding a little bit more pigment, uh, I'm keeping the leading edge of that wash relatively wet, there I'm turning it so that I'm getting gravity to go back in this direction and pull it this way. I am being reasonably careful around the places that I want to be nice and clean. I might add a little bit of red in here just for kicks, maybe a little more yellow, just to kind of brown that up a little bit. And you'll see in the end what I end up getting. See, I've got a little bit of water that's gathering in those places, so I'm tipping my book so that, that kind of starts to go away. And then I resume the wash here. And the reason that I'm adding some variation is just so that it, the wash doesn't end up coming out looking really sort of flat and uninteresting. Uh, a little bit of variation in watercolor is a really nice thing. It kind of livens up the page in a way that you can't necessarily do if you're just if you mix up a full wash and then just apply that you'll see here now i'm getting pretty close i'm going to add a little bit of water there and just finish this wash out right now keeping the gravity working in my favor here now i'm tipping it this way and i'm just going to bring it down to the end and snap out my brush and pick up that excess water right there and leave it alone. Okay, I'll maybe try and show a close-up of that a little bit later, maybe of the whole drawing, and you could, you'll be able to see the kind of variation that I got. It's not just a, a flat gray or a flat brown. There's a little bit of transition in there, and I think that's one of the nice things about watercolor. Now, I still have some pigment in the brush here. There's not a whole lot of water in it, but there's pigment in there. And so before I put the brush back in my reservoir, I'm gonna really snap it out. I do have some plastic down here, so I'm not splattering on my floor. So I've really got all of the water out of there. And then I'll dip it in the water. The brush will pull water into the brush. And then I snap it out again. I do that maybe two or three times. At some point I can really kind of dip it in there and get a lot of water in and then snap it out. And now I've got a nice clean brush and very importantly, I haven't put a bunch of pigment into my water reservoir. I haven't just dumped it in there. So that's one of the reasons why I can use a very, very small reservoir. You end up not using that much water. But if you were just to put a lot of pigment back in there, you end up with dirty water very quickly, and then you can't get very nice transparent washes. So the next thing I'm going to do is maybe paint a bit of uh, the brick out here, and that's really just this stuff up here. There's a lot of kind of ins and outs, so that's going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is give it some variation. So I'm going to start with some alizarin crimson here and mix up a pretty sizable wash because I want it to stay wet. I don't necessarily want to run out of this too quickly. Uh, and then I'm going to snap out my brush a little bit, get a little bit more water. Brush is reasonably clean. And then I'm going to add, uh, this is a color called quinacridin, quinacridone gold, quin gold. Uh, and it's a really nice color. I could just as easily use Azo Yellow or, uh, you know, and more of the Alizarin Crimson, but I do like this gold color. It mixes really nicely with the Crimson, and we end up with something that I can kind of shift back and forth between uh, this sort of gold tone and more of that red tone of the brick. And so now uh, I've got that going. I have a lot of that gold in here, so I'm gonna pick a bit of that up, a bit of the red up, and then start painting. And 
I'm going to move this pretty quickly, or try to anyway. You'll notice I'm just sort of avoiding where the, the plants are going to be. And now this is very dry, so I can put my hand on that. It doesn't take too long to dry if you do a good job of running the wash across the page quickly and then pulling up the excess water. Uh, I'm going to come back and grab a little bit more red here, or crimson, we could call it. Because again, what I'm trying to do is get a bit of variation going. So it's not, you know, totally gold or orange-ish, and it's not totally uh, crimson or red. And I, I might grab a little bit more of that crimson there. And it's okay if it's not totally even. You'll notice some water is pooling up there. So I'm going to snap out my brush and pick that up so it doesn't dry funny. And then pick up the water that's on here and slip it through that little space there. Finish that area. Now I need more wash in my brush because it's getting too dry. So I grab a bit more of that, slide right through there. Do that little area there. Slide between these two areas because these uh, little arches are actually a different color brick and I might just leave those alone. That's one thing that I do want to point out. I don't think you should feel compelled to paint every single inch of the page. It's good sometimes to leave some of the white of the page uh, to give a kind of sense of light and a little bit of more contrast on what you're doing. So again, I'm just kind of working my way around here, filling in these areas as much as I can. When I get to a spot where I need to jump from one area that I'm painting to another, I'm going to snap out my brush and pick up the excess right there so that that dries evenly. Come back and grab a little bit more wash because I just snapped out my brush work my way up here. This little notch up here is brick, so I can actually just paint right over that and then come in later and add some nice darkness, a good dark shadow in there to make that more three-dimensional. You'll notice there's that area there that is pooling up that I can't quite get to just yet. But I'm going to finish this area here snap out my brush and pick that stuff up right there and that stuff up right there and this is a you know kind of convenient pause point right here so I painted that whole area there's some nice variation there's some crimson there's some gold in there uh, and I've taken up the excess water where I've needed to uh, and snapped out my brush and now I can kind of take a little bit of a breather uh, I still have plenty of wash on here to work with, so I can come back and finish the rest of this, which I might as well do right now. And I'm done with that. And I can really just let that dry. I don't want to mess with it. I just picked up a little bit of lint out of there while it was still wet with the tip of the brush, but now I really want to let that dry. There's a couple of spots where the, where the watercolor is kind of breaking, where it's wet here and dry there and you get a little bit of an edge. Don't worry about that. Um, the overall effect is what I'm after. Uh, so now again, I can kind of take a little pause, think about what I'm going to do next. That's really the way that I approach watercolor is one sort of wash at a time. And I go through it, I focus on doing it and then get the excess off the page and then pause and think about what I'm going to do next. 
while I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next, one thing I like to do is keep my palette reasonably clean. I don't just keep like filling the whole thing with washes. Uh, I'll snap out my brush, get some water in it, maybe add some water to where there used to be a wash, and then snap that out and then pick up the water from my palette with my brush, snap it out, do that a couple of times, and then when it's really snapped out, get some fresh water, snap out the brush again, and in just that amount of time I've got a nice clean place to work again uh, and move on to another wash. My reservoir is nice and clean, my brush is nice and clean. If I think I might be using, you know, that brick tone again, maybe I leave this wash alone for now, or maybe I clean it up as well. So the next thing I'm going to focus on here is just a little bit of that stone at the base. And for that, I really, you know, I'm going to focus on that being fairly gray. Uh, you do have in your kit some Payne's gray, uh, which is just, as it says, it's a gray tone, right? And it's, it's got some character to it. It's kind of bluish. It's not a totally flat tone. Um, but I often like to kind of liven that up a little bit by adding either a little bit of, um, what is this, burnt umber, which I think you also have in your, your kit. Uh, or, yeah, I think it's burnt umber. Anyway, it changes the character of it. I might even add some uh, ultramarine blue to that Payne's Gray to kind of make it a little bit more blue. Anyway, little bits at a time, little experiments uh, as you're moving a, a, a wash across the page is a good way to work with watercolor. So I'll start kind of dropping this in here right now. Oh, that's darker than I really wanted it to be. So I'm going to snap out my brush, grab a little bit of extra water, and then right before that really dries, get in there and put some fresh water on it and move it. And that is how, like, if you if your brush hits the page and it's like, ooh, that's darker than I wanted it to be, snap out your brush right away and grab some fresh water and uh, get it on there. And that will disperse that kind of uh, saturated pigment. Another thing you can do while it's still pretty wet, that whole area that I painted is, is still wet, I can grab a little bit of that pigment and drop it in. A little bit that's going to give a bit of that variation that I've talked about but there's probably a bit more water on there than I really want so I have to kind of pull that off and be careful not to let it dry in a sort of splotchy uneven way so I need to bring more of that water off of the page and then maybe I can come in with a little bit of that pigment and drop it in don't do much of that though. If you start really finicking, finicking <laughs> with it, it ends up being very splotchy. So really do what you can to move the water across the page, get the excess off and let it dry. Don't keep going back in there and messing with it. You can always come in later after it is dry and add, uh, you know, slightly darker tones or just the exact same level of pigment over the top of that, and that'll be two layers of that pigment, that'll make where you paint next a little bit darker. So that, that's another way that you can approach this, if you think in terms of layers. Oops, I guess I want to do these kind of uh, elements at the stair here as well. And, you know, again, you'll notice once you kind of get comfortable with this, you can move through this stuff pretty quickly uh, and then come back and pick up the excess water. So you can do kind of a little, you know, multiple areas as long as you're kind of keeping an eye on it. And then you snap out and pull up that extra water here, there, here, and there. Okay, I'm back. Uh, one of my cameras kind of cut out on me. I think the battery ran out. But basically what I did is I kind of finished up the, the, uh, the stone down at the bottom. I'm not really worried about making a bunch of texture and showing individual stone for now. I want to focus on the overall drawing more than anything. 
One thing I might do is add a little bit of kind of golden color to uh, some of the trim. That was definitely something that I was noticing out there. So uh, some kind of gold, maybe a, a little bit of this yellow ochre, and maybe what do I want to do? Kind of knock it back a little bit. Nah, maybe a little bit of yellow. Um, so. I'm just kind of experimenting here a little bit. That looks about right. I want to keep it light. So I've got a you know nice wash mixed up there and I'm just gonna come in here and I'm not gonna necessarily paint all of it. Uh, the reason being I want, again, as I said before, some of the sort of lightness the, to, to be part of what I'm showing here. You know, sunlight uh, on the facade and I might try to get in and show a little bit of uh, how I would add some shadows. I just got some lint on there that I had to pick up out of there. Uh, and, and some of the stone has this kind of light character as well. So I'm going to hit a little bit of that. Not a lot. Uh, I just want to kind of pop that out just a, a touch. You know, I don't want to over go overboard with this yellow. I'm going to keep it relatively light on the page and I'm not being super careful with it. I'm just adding a little bit of that yellow color. That's all. Uh, I think that, you know, I might put some of that on the bottom stone arches as well. Looks like I missed one in there. That's okay. Uh, and as well up here on the monitor because that is painted that same kind of trim color for the most part. Uh, so I'm going to add that yellow up there, snap out my brush and pick up the excess and we're good. And that's, uh, that's pretty much, I think all the yellow that I really want to put on there. I guess I missed that cap up here. I might add a little bit on there. Done. Right. I think. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, another couple of things that I want to show are landscape elements, you know, how I might uh, approach some of those, and uh, shadows, and a little bit of, you know, color and darkness on the windows. Windows, uh, I usually like to add just a, a touch of blue, as the, especially the windows that are kind of up high on a building, as though we're seeing some reflected uh, sky. Okay. I, I don't usually kind of, you know, fill all the windows in. Uh, I just, I want to add kind of a hint of blue here and there. I might get a little bit more intense with it in some areas. Again, you're not trying to kind of color everything in or fill in all the boxes, but some bit of blue in there can be uh, a nice thing in some windows. It gives it a sense that, again, it's reflecting the sky. It's not that the glass is blue. It's that the glass is reflective, okay? And you kind of just add a little bit of that here and there, and that's probably going to do the trick, okay? You don't want to go overboard with it, and you can see just how kind of quickly I'm trying to get it on there. More than enough at this point. Uh, I'm not really worried about these ones down below. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit of reflectivity up there, and the the uh, the windows up above. I'll add a little bit more blue to that one. Okay. Um, while I've got some blue on my palette, I usually start landscape uh, elements with blue believe it or not, and some yellow. Because, yeah, it's true, blue and yellow do make a kind of green. And rather than uh, picking a green, you'll notice I have one green on my palette and it's very neglected. I don't use green very often. So I start with uh, blue and yellow. And I don't really try and mix them too well. Uh, in fact, I kind of keep going back and grabbing a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. But the same thing applies. I want to think about this as a wash and move it across the page. I'm really just doing an area. 
I am being careful about working my way around the perimeter of the building and I might even want to make it a little bit dark when I get in close to the building so that what we see is a dark kind of background against this light building, okay? Uh, and that's, you know, just a matter of kind of trying to develop some depth in the drawing. So it's like the elevation is kind of out in front of this tree. And also, as the, the foliage kind of drops down, it wants to get darker because it's not getting as much sunlight from the sun. So, and I, you know, you can see I'm not even being that worried about adding like some red in there to really kind of mix up the, the colors. Uh, I might add, you know, some branches, kind of like so. Uh, I don't want to get too fussy with it, so that's probably going to do it. We'll leave it right there, make that edge nice and dark, and then pull off that excess water. And that's a, a tree in the background, right? A tree in the foreground, I might try and keep reasonably light. You'll notice, snap this out, I'm just using the same wash right here, and there's kind of different components to it. There's some blue, there's some yellow, there's even some red, right? Because there is a lot of variation in foliage, you'll notice. I need more water on there. And now I'm going to start kind of dropping it in here. This is going to be a nice wet kind of wash here. And I'm just going to carry it down. I'm going to start on this little tree here as well. And this one. And I'm letting that stay nice and wet. I'm just kind of putting some water on the page. Then I'm going to come and grab some darkness, some blue, and start dropping that in there a little bit to give, again, a sense of variation. So I'm not mixing up just a green tone and painting a tree with green. And I'm also thinking kind of carefully about uh, the shapes of these things. You know, in some cases, like this tree up here, kind of a little bubbly thing is fine. Uh, but we have a lot of evergreens around here and it's nice to start to see some of the, you know, kind of variation on these trees and shrubs and that kind of thing. Variation both in terms of color and in terms of the form. Uh, so that's what I'm really trying to focus on here. And as I get down closer to the ground, I'm probably gonna even add a little bit of gold in there and darken that up some more with some more blue. Uh, so we get some nice shade and shadow down in the bottom. And you can see I'm working pretty quick here. I want to drop in where that slope goes down. And done, right? I'm not even having to pull a whole lot of water off of there because I was using quite a bit of pigment uh, in there. It's going to take a little time to dry, but that does the trick. Uh, I can kind of do that up over here while I still have my brush loaded. Add, you know, some lighter trees kind of poking up here, some evergreens in the background. Uh, even though I was going to put some text there, maybe the text goes right over that. And, and those are, you can see, are kind of faded out a little bit. I'm um, just using, you know, what's in my brush and it's become, it's mixed together. It's become a li little bit more gray. Uh, whereas this stuff in the front over here, I might um, want to make that a little brighter and more yellow. So I'm just going to grab some yellow here and start painting that stuff. And if I need to, I can come back in and add a little bit of blue or even a little bit of red. Grab some of this. And I'm being pretty loose with it, but... Uh, I'm not being careless. I'm not just being sloppy. I mean, I'm giving it form that says this is plant material, and I'm giving it color that says that this is plant material, right? But I am just kind of filling an area here that I mapped out before when I did the drawing when I was out there. And make sure 
sure that wash gets completed. And snap out my brush, clean it out a little bit and let that dry. And just that quick, I put some, uh, you know, whoops, did I bump the camera? I put some foliage, you know, some plant material out there. Uh, the only other thing that I would do here, at least for the purpose of this video, is to add some shadows, some shade. And in that case, I, I'm going to work, kind of lay in one layer of uh, some darkness and then another layer. So I'm looking specifically at this entryway. Uh, I know that that's, you know, kind of um, grayish back in there, but maybe there's some brick in there. I'm, I don't know. The color doesn't matter all that much. I'm just going to go with kind of a gray. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that it's all just one tone to start with. Because it's kind of back in there. And so I just want to fill that area with kind of a gray to say that that is set back from the facade a little bit. It doesn't look very dark. It doesn't look like a shadow yet, but it will. Um, while that's drying, I'm going to add a shadow over here, or at least start to. So I'm going to come back to my brick color because a shadow on brick is basically going to be the a saturated version of that brick. And while I was out there, I was kind of observing this where this drops down. There's a shadow that came down from there. And you can see I'm not too worried about, uh, you know, what's behind it. I'm just going to give it a little bit of a lip there and then drop this guy down like so. And I'm stopping where the brick stops. I might actually pull it right to there. And then snap out my brush and grab some blue, make it a nice kind of rich purple to go down to the stone down below. And because that kind of disappears into the plant material there, I'm not too worried about precision. Uh, I'm just kind of making it dark. And now we've got a shadow there that's starting to pop that thing out while I've still got my brush loaded with this kind of uh, purple color. I'm going to come in here and again, I observe this pretty carefully. That's not dry enough yet. I got to stop that right now. That's okay. That little splotch. I got to wait until this really dries better um, because otherwise I won't get a nice clean edge on that shadow. So I'm going to leave that for right now. I might just uh, with, you know, some dark tone start coming in here and maybe dropping in some shadows on these windows to give them a little bit of three-dimensional quality, right? Or even in here, these arches, uh, that kind of thing, right? I'm not worried about being super precise with it, but I am trying to be kind of careful, you know. Uh, I'm just giving a little bit of depth. That's it. That's really all I'm trying to do with these little shadows in the windows and under those mullions. Obviously, I would want to do that up underneath uh, the roof projection as well. That's going to kind of drop down from here. It seems to me that that comes up to there. And then we get a shadow that drops down to there. I might come back and make that a livelier kind of brick shadow that might be a little strong but we'll see uh, and then I'm really just going to kind of pull it right across these windows even though I just painted across those windows and start doing that shadow and I might just pull it all the way across you know this is an experiment uh, I'm experimenting with these shadows here and I'm also kind of tucking them back into those windows a little bit And then just pull it out to there. And now I've got a shadow. And one of the things I want you to pay attention to there is that there's light in that shadow. It's relatively transparent. That's why moving the wash across the page is, is fairly important. I would do, you know, the same thing up here. That's probably a shadow there. 
uh, probably drops into that little grill a little bit and we see some some shadow up underneath that thing uh, etc so now I'm kind of trying to give it some three-dimensional quality uh, I think this is probably dry enough now so I can come back here and really give a nice heavy shadow at that archway so I'm using uh, ultramarine and alizarin crimson to really mix up a kind of reasonably dark purple but it is still transparent and this is going to take the form of that archway so I'm painting that archway to start with uh, give it a little more intensity there and now that I've got the leading edge of it I'm turning this thing over and I'm gonna pull that wash away from the front edge of that wash and hopefully you'll see what happens here when I do that. What I'm doing is what's called forcing shadows. We'll talk about this more later in the semester. But now there is a shadow right there. There would want to be a shadow that drops down uh, these stairs that kind of continues that. So kind of there, 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 there. So I'm going to add that shadow. I made it a little bit red. I don't know why, but it's okay. <laughs> and then there's that shadow that's dropping down the stairs there. So I'm starting again to give it a kind of sense of three-dimensional character. I might come up here and say that, that this thing is a little bit darker on one side than the other. So uh, maybe I'll kind of just paint a light wash across part of it and then pull that up. Get it to dry a little bit and then come in and do another layer. It's not really dry yet. <laughs> I'll do another layer there. It's going to get a little sloppy if I do this too much. But then what I'm going to do is add the final layer here around the back that's even darker so that we get that sense that that thing is dark on one side and light on the other and probably that there is a little bit of a shadow kind of coming from that as well. It starts to become, oh, I keep kicking the, the camera, it starts to become more three-dimensional. So I would, I would continue that across here. I'd be adding, you know, uh, shadows where it made sense and, uh, and then probably be all done. Uh, there's one spot up here, that little notch window or whatever it is this little notch up in here that thing wants to get a nice dark shadow because it's just a little deep pocket up in there uh, and I could you know again keep going with things like shadows in these windows etc hopefully you're starting to get the idea and then at that point, uh, I would come in here and add the text, and I'd be good to go. <clears throat> I guess one more thing I might show is how I might approach uh, dropping a sky in here. Just for kicks, I'm going to clean out my brush. And one of the things I like to do with skies is to put down some water and then introduce watercolor pigment to that water and let the water do interesting things to the pigment. So I'm putting pure water on the page here uh, and quite a bit of it actually but I'm being careful not to run over what I've already painted on the building uh, and it's probably hard to see on the video but Trust me, there's water all around there. I'm going to tip it and pull a little of the excess off of that. And then I'm going to grab quite a bit of this ultramarine. There's already an area that's drying right here, so that's going to be a little wonky. But I'm going to just tip the book and drop some blue in here. And then let it go. Maybe get some more water. A 
and let that stuff kind of dissolve into the water and pull up that extra water. I didn't do it terribly well this time. I've done it better before, but you get the idea. You see how many times I'm snapping out my brush and pulling up a lot of extra water? Because you do need a lot of water on the page to get that kind of an effect where, where the pigment really disperses into, uh, into, well, into the water. <laughs> That's still pretty wet, so I have to be careful not to be tipping the book in strange ways, but I could uh, add to that. I could kind of come over here and do something similar where I take a bunch of this blue and pick out that tower a little bit more cleanly by putting some blue up against it and then running that blue out. I could also kind of, you know, start to make it organized in a sense, like where I'm giving myself an edge here that uh, this little monitor, I don't know what it is, a lightning rod or something that is kind of poking up there, that kind of slips past that little boundary edge. And then I could even kind of come over here and say that uh, this is going to be the area where there's going to be text. I don't know, I've never done anything like that before, but we'll see. And then I'm tipping it so that I can really collect that extra water. And now I've got just a light little blue patch there. Soften that edge where I'm going to put a title. Um, once that dries, I can go in there with pen and write something down. Uh, I guess that's probably about it for now. Um, more than enough information to get you started with. I'll shoot a picture of this when I'm all done with it and finish the video with that. Hopefully this has been helpful and uh, we'll catch you next time. See ya.